after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome in to another episode of Moving the Goalposts. I'm Nick DiMartino. And Liam. Um, all right, so uh, you can follow us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the Empty the Bench Network on YouTube. Uh, YouTube.com slash ETB Network. You can listen to Moving the Goalposts wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you know, Spotify, Apple, po- Apple Podcasts, wherever. Um Make sure to like and subscribe, and you can follow me on Twitter at Nick Demart uh, and Liam at Liam MTGP, and you can follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at MTGPETB. All right, I think that's everything. <laughs> so uh, let's get into it. We have to get into the whole national championship stuff. I did a, an eight. I, I did like a nine minute recap. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to get into. This is not exactly – the game didn't go that much different from what I expected other than the fact that the offenses were a lot worse than I thought. Um, I felt a little bit bad for Penix at the end of the game, to be honest, because he was in – it seemed like he was in a lot of pain. I give a lot of credit to Washington. They had a great season. Um Overall, um, just congratulations to Harbaugh for bringing back that program from oblivion, basically, uh, to being national champions. Yeah, it was a terrible game, though. It was it was a really bad game. Like the offenses were really stagnant. It was it was it was not a good game. Um, I don't agree. Penix, just a, I you don't agree. I, it was a bad. I think the consensus was that it was a bad game. I don't think. Yeah, was but a lot the consensus I think is good. wrong. I, I think a lot of people are agreeing with you, but I don't think it was a bad game. I thought it was entertaining. Well, I, well, it was, it was, it was close, but for the most part. But I mean, Penix missed a bunch of throws. Like he missed the one on the fourth down in the second quarter. Um, if, if if Washington were to run the ball, they couldn't do anything, and then if Michigan were to throw the ball, they couldn't do anything. So it wasn't one of the better games. Um, and obviously, I think you have to mention that they called the game very liberally, which is fair in a championship game. As I pointed out in the recap, uh, Michigan got away with a lot. Washington might've got away with a lot. And then Washington makes a big play to get with the game 20 to 13 in the fourth quarter. They make a big play to get into Michigan territory. And they call that chintzy holding call. That wasn't even a holding that pushed Washington back and then set up, Michigan for the touchdown. Like I, I couldn't stand that. And well, Washington could have, could have probably come down and tied the game. If you're going well, to call the game liberally, then call the whole game liberally. You know. Yeah. Am, am I not remembering that one? Uh, it was they. They threw a 30 yard pass into, into like the Michigan 30, and they called the, oh. the holding because he pulled his left his left hand. Oh, right. I think that was a blatant holding call, though. No, it was not. Even the reporter said it wasn't a holding. Well, hold on. I, I got to look at that play again. Uh, but, but I agree I, I that I might be misremembering. But um, I agree that. Uh, but, but calling the game more liberally doesn't mean you don't make any calls. Well, but Michigan like, got there's a blatant a lot of holding call, defense. a blatant pass interference. This was not He's a blatant a holding call. It was only but, a hold because he used a different hand. But um, I have to look at the play again. Because I'm sort of misremembering it. Um, but I will say this. 
I think that just because Penix missed a lot of really good throws, and a lot of easy throws, and Michigan's offense was horrible in the third quarter, and there's no denying that Michigan's offense was horrible in the third quarter, that doesn't mean the game wasn't entertaining. The game was entertaining it, it, just because the game, just because the offenses weren't good doesn't mean that the game wasn't thoroughly entertaining. It would have been a lot worse if one team was like dominating the other, like last year's national championship game. I, I mean, this it's year, I still think it was – I mean, here, the problem I, I, the problem with Washington is that they were rely, they were a little bit too reliant on Penix the whole game. I mean, he threw the ball 51 times. How often do quarterbacks, even in the NFL, throw the ball 51 times? Um, that he's never thrown the ball that much, even in, even throughout the season. And then also it's like, we're remembering Washington beat Oregon twice and beat Texas that we're forgetting that like, they have had a lot of spots of inconsistency and sloppiness throughout the season. And it's happened, it's happened quite a few times. They've ended up winning, but I mean, Washington certainly has not been a flawless team. I, I mean, it's not exactly too shocking to me that Washington struggled against what is arguably the best defense in college football. Um, I, I think the only part to me that was a bit shocking was that Penix missed easy throws, which you can't attribute to the defense. I mean, he was 27 for 51, which is barely over 50%. But all of that was not his fault either. A lot of it was just easy passes that players that guys dropped like when Nixon dropped that the running back dropped that easy pass where he would have barely mm -hmm. it, it would have been an easy first down uh it, it was it was a third down pass it was the easiest pass i've ever one of the easiest passes i've ever seen and the guy drops it like there was a lot of that too um jj mccarthy wasn't great but they didn't rely on him that much like he only threw the ball 18 times I mean, the thing is, McCarthy can afford to not be great. And the truth is, he hasn't been great lately. I mean, like, they're good in spite of him in, in a weird sense. Like, he's good enough to the point where it, he's good enough to the point where he's serviceable. But they're not good because of McCarthy. If anything, they're good because of their run game. And they had a few really great runs. Um, but I will say the defense was generally good on both sides. I mean, it's not just about the offense. Yeah, but it's not. It's still not. It, I don't think that it was a good goal, but it was. It's it, especially compared to the other two games. But I agree that it went well. It went the start certainly went as I thought it was going to go because I thought Michigan was going to smack Washington around, and then Michigan really let them hang around for a really long time. Yeah, which they shouldn't. Um, it, yeah, uh, I don't think Michigan played a good. I, honestly, I don't think. Michigan played a good game, but the thing with football is that I think that when teams don't play good games, I think it can get more entertaining. I think that's the difference between football and basketball. I think in basketball, if both sides aren't playing well, the game becomes significantly less entertaining, whereas in football, that's not always true. Um, I think that, especially in college, I think that teams messing up a lot and making mistakes just adds to the plot twists. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, it was, I mean, it wasn't going to be an all-time classic, but I agree that I give Harbaugh credit because there was a lot of times where Michigan fans even, and the national media was thinking that Harbaugh was going to get fired, like pre, probably about 2019 when they lost that game to Ohio State in 2019. Um, it was a lot of talk about him being fired, certainly brought the program back, might have been his last game which we'll talk about a little later when we talk about coaches, but might've been his last game at Michigan. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I give them a lot of credit and I give obviously Washington a lot of credit. I mean, Washington, wa like Oregon gets a lot of talk, but I think that you would have to say that as the PAC 12 ended, Washington was the premier program of the PAC 12. I mean, they were the only team that made the playoffs. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's well, yeah. Or at least for this season. I mean, they, they, they were, They've always hung around. They've typically hung around in recent years. I mean, they've made the playoff one other year. Um, That's what I'm saying. They're the only Pac-12 team that made the playoff. To ever make the – they're not the only Pac-12 team to ever make the playoff. Yeah, who else? Are they? Yeah. When Oregon played Auburn, that was a BCS. That was, it was still BCS. 
Oh, maybe you're right. Maybe they are the only yeah, they Pac-12 are. team. The only Pac-12 yeah. team. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, there there were other Pac-12 teams that were able to hang on. That were able to get. Actually, that's not true. Oregon made the playoff. The first year. Wasn't that BCS? No. They played Oregon. No, it was the year Ohio State won. No. Anyway, um, <laughs> they're the second they, team. Yeah, so they well, they're the, the only team to make it twice then. Um, yeah. But um, but still, uh, yeah. So yeah, credit to both teams, but I just didn't think it was it was a great game. Um, yeah. But it, it, it. But the thing is, is that like. I think it was not a well played game necessarily. I just think it was entertaining. And to be and to be completely honest about Michigan, Michigan hasn't played great games, particularly on offense, in like the past month and a half. Like against Iowa, against Alabama, and this time against Washington. I mean, Michigan just hasn't been playing great games. I, I mean, that's why part of the reason I wouldn't consider them to be like one of the best teams ever. That I don't think they're like. 2019 LSU or the 2020 Alabama team or anything like that. Cause, but th- like, like you said last week, it kind of showed how good they were that they didn't have to play a very good game and were still able to win by what felt like what seems like looking back a lot, but, but it wasn't, I thought, I thought Washington had a real chance when they were down by 20 to 13 in the third quarter. I thought Washington easily could have come back because Michigan was not moving the ball at all. And, Washington wasn't moving the ball either, but they had, but it felt like they were moving the ball easier than Michigan was because they were missing easy passes. And whereas Michigan, it didn't feel like they were able to move the ball much at all. And they did rush for over 300 yards. They rushed for 300 yards, but that's because they had a few really big runs. They had three huge runs. Yeah. So, yeah, early in the game with Donovan Edwards and Blake Corum. So it, it wasn't. Michigan's offense really didn't look great most of the game, which I sort of expected a little bit, um, particularly with their passing game. Um, mm. uh, although, uh, it, although as much as we want to talk about how the offenses weren't great, the defenses really weren't all that bad. Um, it, it, there also weren't as many like special team screw ups like mm. there were with Alabama. Uh, no, Alabama. not like they were in the Rose Bowl. Certainly not. Um, but yeah, but you know, I, I, they are very. And you were talking about Harbaugh before, uh, and, and Harbaugh is. It, a lot of people criticized Harbaugh in the past, uh, very often in the national media, sports media, whatever, um, for not beating his rivals enough, or for, or for Michigan not getting over the hump. And I, I feel like they were holding him to. An, an unfair and kind of impossible standard uh, because how can you make that claim about Harbaugh when you have to consider where the team, how the team was when he took over? Uh, it, it's not really, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to criticize Michigan and compare them to say Ohio state or Michigan state or Penn state at the time when Michigan was, a total joke when the year before Harbaugh took over and there aren't a lot of coaches who could have done with Michigan, what Harbaugh did. I mean, he made them relevant again. Not, not a whole lot of coaches could have done with Michigan what Harbaugh did. Yeah. But sports is a really reactionary business. So it's uh, It's, it's it's a reactionary business and fans are, are reactionary. I'm just saying it doesn't, you're not looking at it from a reasonable standpoint. If you say that, you know, oh, Harbaugh is overrated because, well, he he didn't beat Ohio State. I mean, nobody was able to beat Ohio State until Harbaugh took over. I right. mean, like, what, what, what Michigan has always been, for a very long time, wasn't able to beat Ohio State. And he at least made them uh, competitive. And it's not exactly easy to go into such a strong division, uh, the Big Ten East, and, you know, turn a – dying program around that's not an easy thing to do and and honestly in recent years i could think of maybe i could probably count on one hand the number of coaches that could have done with michigan what harbaugh did there's very few um you know saban urban uh maybe kirby smart 
maybe Pete Carroll and Harbaugh. I mean, that, that's maybe mm -hmm. the five coaches that could have done with Michigan, but they were what Harbaugh was able to do. Yeah, he's done a tr tremendous job. Yeah. Certainly. And people are talking about how this might be his last game at Michigan. Um, so the past 48 hours – have been a crazy time for coaches. Um, it seems like all of the – so basically the Patriots fired Bill Belichick. Never thought that would ever happen. Well, they didn't fire him, but yeah. So well, what happened exactly? They parted ways? Yeah, which was kind of firing, but they didn't officially fire him. Right. Okay. Um, uh, so they parted ways. I never thought that I would see Bill Belichick not be in a Patriots hoodie on the sidelines. Um uh, the Seahawks, uh, Pete Carroll's no longer the Seahawks head coach, although he's still with the organization. Um, mm -hmm. I never thought that would happen. And Nick Saban, just out of the blue, completely uh, just retired. Um, I'm sort of surprised about, I'm more surprised if anything with the Saban stuff, because he if he seems like the kind of guy who would rather go out on top uh, rather than losing in the playoff. Yeah. First of all, Pete Carroll has to be the most pissed off man in America. Like, his retirement announcement lasted like five minutes because then Nick Saban and Bill Belichick totally chose, stole his shine yeah. uh, and like stole his thunder. Um, uh, the few, first few things I have, uh, Nick, Saban, um, Nick, Sa Nick Saban is probably the greatest college coach ever. And if you, um, if you like look at his numbers, he's got the most national championships, most with uh, – Pete Carroll is maybe one of the most underrated coaches ever. He's actually the I only agree. he's actually the only coach in history to win a national championship and a Super Bowl. Um, nobody's ever done that, um, and I think he doesn't get a lot of you know the the uh, the respect. I and mean, if you remember, if like the respect he deserves, if you remember, obviously, if if they ran the ball to Marshawn Lynch or if they go on to win that Super Bowl, he would have won two Super Bowls in a row, which is not done very often um and he had he only left like he only left um usc because of something that's regularly done now with play, players getting paid so like he yeah. never he never left an organization bad like where he had a bad season the seahawks have never really had a bad season under pete carroll like a, when they uh, like a, could have had bad seasons last year they could have they were expected to win like five games last year and they made the playoffs this year they had equally not as good a roster and they got very close to making the playoffs. So he did a good job. And then um, Belichick, I, I feel, is is um, sort of on the opposite end. I think Belichick is an extremely overrated coach and he was exposed once Tom Brady left. And now remember, the also, he got a lot of good players – to cut, he was a GM, so he got a lot of good players to come to the Patriots. But as a uh, former NFL player said the other day, um, they don't have a, a incentive to come to the Patriots anymore because Tom Brady isn't there. So Tom Brady was yeah. a lot of the recruitment um, elements as well to the Patriots, those Patriot teams. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to say I agree. I mean, another – I don't know if he's so much underrated anymore, but I would say Andy Reid I think for a long time was a very underrated head coach. Um, well, he couldn't win not Super so much Bowl. anymore. He's not before he won a Super Bowl. Correct. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Actually, with uh, Pete Carroll, I think is underrated. Um, a legend in the coaching game. Uh, Nick Saban. I, I just never expected this to happen. I guess we have to remember that he's 72 years old and it doesn't feel like that's old, that's that old anymore for a college football coach. Um, I guess he just sort of had enough. Um, it's not an easy job being the head coach of a major college football program. It's like a 24 seven job. You don't have a lot of time off. You're constantly recruiting. You're constantly like you win a national championship game. You have five minutes to celebrate and then you have to go back on the recruiting trail. Like it's not an easy job. Um, it's it, in many ways, it's significantly harder than being an NFL coach because you're basically the GM and the head coach. Like, it, there's a lot more weight on your shoulders as a college football coach. 
Yeah, so he's 72. At 72, he's, you know, he's one of the older football coaches. He would be the youngest member of the House of Congress if he – Yeah. From but uh, he is um, – <laughs> It goes to is, show you being a, a Congress versus being a football coach. What's harder? <laughs> he is a dude. I wanted to read this, this um, stat, by the way, about Nick Saban. So since Nick Saban took over in 2007, Alabama's enrollment has increased. This is um, – has increased – but from 25,000 students to 40,000 students. Uh, but type of student per also. Year. Alabama went from majority of its student body being in-state to majority being out-of-state. And uh, so the the significance there is that out-of-state pays three times more. So in Alabama increased its annual revenue by hundreds of millions under Nick Saban. Yeah, I wonder how much – well, I, I wonder how much of that – if anything, it probably. I wonder how much of that is because of Saban, or how much of that is just the normal trajectory. Well, a lot. Well, uh, I can tell you because the uh, the sixty that's a sixty percent jump of students in that time span, and the national average is ten percent. Okay, so that's a lot. It's a huge jump. I mean, a lot of st- like a lot of um, people's first. Uh, like kids first um, exposure to colleges is through sports. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. So, um, it was for, at least for boys generally and in the yeah. South. Uh, yeah. yeah that's, like I mean, would... it's not so much true in the Northeast. Um, it, no, it could also be know. college. It could also be your first exposure to sports is college football or college basketball. Well, like, like nobody would know what Gonzaga was if it wasn't for basketball. Like, yeah, I would not know live in that area. So yeah, the, he's, he's, he's done like good, but past that, but yeah, college football and, and college football is worse than the NFL because you have to recruit and stuff, which is kind of what Bill Belichick was. Bill Belichick was kind of a college coach in the NFL. Yeah. Cause he was the just GM. like Jim Kelly was right. Cause he was the GM and the, um, Head coach, but yeah, I, I I also just think it's an underrated stat about Pete Carroll. And you know the the thing that I also about Pete Carroll is all those guys that were on that USC team, pretty much none of them panned out in the NFL, which could also speak to how Pete Carroll got the best out of those players. You know and, what? Yeah, I think you're right. You certainly could say he got the best out of Russell Wilson. I was just going to say that it seems like he is doing that now to be fair. You can kind of say that about a lot of coaches. I mean, there's a lot of players that are really good in college that don't pan out in the NFL. Um, I mean, that's certain. It's not particularly uncommon regardless of who's coaching them. Um, mm-hmm. I, it, Cause just because it's a different game and you know, college is just a lower level. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Reggie Bush was a star in college. Uh, now I think, I, I think largely because of the team that was built around him. I mean, like being a running back in at USC is significantly e- with a powerhouse program is significantly easier than in the NFL. Um, it, it, it's just vastly different. You have the, you have the best team around you. You have, uh, and you have an elite coaching staff an elite, everything around you, not to mention generally much milder weather, uh, than in the NFL, uh, it's it just everything is in much weaker defenses in the Pac-12. It's just, or at the time, the Pac-10, uh, it just much easier for a guy like that. But I think the Russell Wilson part is, and Geno Smith part is a, another big, another big one. I mean, mm-hmm. Russell Wilson leaves the Seahawks, goes to Denver, and sucks even with Sean Payton as his head coach, um, right. and. Geno Smith developed a reputation for being a terrible quarterback goes to plays under Pete Carroll is surprisingly good. (laughs) Like it it does tell you a lot about whatever system he runs, especially with particularly with running quarterbacks. It it seems like. Yeah. And I want to say real quick, since you mentioned USC, Caleb Williams posted a picture from his penthouse apartment that he paid for with NIL uh, and meanwhile, from the same school, Reggie Bush had his Heisman Trophy taken away because yeah. he took a small payment. That's a disgrace. They should give Reggie Bush his Heisman Trophy back. I, I totally agree. I mean, I don't. I never understood the NCAA's weird obsession with amateurism, like this sort of amateurism purity culture that they have, um, which they don't really have so much anymore because of the NIL money. 
Uh, I never understood the concept of it or why it mattered if players, God forbid, took money. Um, and it wasn't even like you had to take a lot of money. Like, it, it was just minor, silly, it, it was minor frivolous amounts of money that I don't think anybody could have really cared about. Um, these athletes, in fact, are marketable. How can you be mad at somebody for using their marketability to make money? It, it just never made a whole lot of sense to me. Um, also, even if you do have a problem with him taking money, I don't understand what that even has to do with his Heisman Trophy anyway. He still won the Heisman Trophy because of his play on the field. It, it's just silly to me to say that you're no, you no longer – have this Heisman Trophy, and we're going to pretend that nobody won it. It never really made any sense to me. It would be like taking away – it would almost be like taking away like a player's MVP award because they broke the rules. Like it's, It just doesn't make any sense. And one really – like it's not like he won the Heisman because he got all that money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that had exactly. nothing to do with it. He just broke the rule. It wasn't performance enhancing money. Like it just doesn't, it, it never made sense to me. And I think they should, like, it doesn't make any sense to, uh, to keep his trophy when he, what he did is just commonplace now and completely accepted. I think that's always how it should be. Like if you did something that was against the rules at the time and now it's totally fine under the same exact circumstances, they it, you should not be punished anymore. That's stupid. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, the only exception to that might be if like they had some type of unfair, if a team gets an unfair advantage and then they, and they say won a bowl game or whatever because of this unfair advantage, then maybe you, there might be an argument there. Um, but not if everybody else is, but that's a bit of a gray area kind of thing, but with a player individually taking money, it's vastly different. I don't know what the trajectory of Pete Carroll's career would have been had he stayed at USC. I mean, I, I can imagine USC would be much better off than they are now, um, mm -hmm. or at least for a longer period of time. We don't know what would have happened exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, it is nuts how the NCAA is not giving him his Heisman back. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and yeah, I mean, and by the way, Caleb Williams must be getting a lot of money, a lot of NIL money if he's paying for a penthouse <laughs> in California. In LA, um, yeah. Yeah, I in know. LA. I mean, like that. It, yeah, that's it's crazy, crazy how much has changed. Yeah, um, and people are talking about uh, where Bel Belichick is going to go. And by the way, you're, we were talking about Harbaugh before. I don't see him leaving Michigan. Um, I, know. I know a lot of people don't agree. I, now, I could be wrong about that. I'm not saying I, I can't be wrong about that, or at least not yet. I don't see him leaving yet. I feel like he might want to win multiple championships with Michigan before he leaves. And he's getting paid a lot of money, and I'm sure he loves gonna... being there. Yeah, but you're forgetting that they're going to get these and the sanctions from the NCA and stuff. I, I guess that's true. I guess he might leave because of that, which for these recruiting violations during COVID. I mean, that's why Pete um, Carroll left. Yeah, it's a it's a similar kind of thing, um, yeah. which every coach seems to violate. Like it, it's every or at least every good coach, um, it, and uh, yeah, that's it's. it's I don't know. I, I guess it depends on how harsh it is. Um, mm. I I could I, – I, I just – I don't know. I, I Just because I said I don't see him leaving doesn't mean he's not going to because I don't think anybody would have said, I see Saban retiring. Right. Or I uh, – so I don't know. Uh, it, we all felt that way. Um, I, I personally – like I said, I don't see him leaving. I, I could see Belichick going to the Chargers. Yeah, I agree. That would be the destination. I think that would be the move that would make the most sense. Uh, he has the most to work with. It's a much uh, – it, it's certain I, – I mean, it, it. both divisions are tough, the AFC East and the uh, AFC West. Um, but – because, you know, you have to deal with the Chiefs and the Bills. The weather's a lot nicer in San Diego, a lot milder than in uh, – than in Massachusetts. I mean, you could basically retire there. Uh, it, it, and he has a much better, he would have a much better situation 
than uh, than he would in uh, with the Patriots. I mean, yeah. he is a good young quarterback. Yeah, well, it would be crazy if if he moved to San Diego, considering that the Chargers don't play there anymore. But um, I'm but sorry, yeah. Los Angeles, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but okay, yeah, I, us, Southern California is the same. Okay, San Diego and Los Angeles are the same thing to us. <laughs> well, um, but um, I agree, and also the the division is not as tough as it once was because the Chiefs have have uh, considerably gotten worse this year. And they'll probably won't. They probably won't get back to the level they have been in the pre- previous years, just because guys are getting older and and. Yeah, I mean, like we said that. the same thing about the Bills two months ago. So what about? But, but I agree. He has the be- That would be the best situation. Like, I, it doesn't really make any sense to go to the Commanders because again, you would be in a tough division with you if you like the Commanders, the other team that gets named. You would have three teams that made the playoffs last year. Now, obviously, this year only two teams made the playoffs, but the Giants, Eagles, and Cowboys are better than the Commanders. So you're the fourth team in division, where if you started in the AFC West, you would be the second team in the division. Yeah. And and by the way, Belichick, I'm sure, knows that if he were to coach the Commanders, he'd have basically the same results that he had in New England, most likely. Right. And exactly. And then if you play – like, your biggest obstacle is the Chiefs, where, like, you would have the 49ers who are – I think a better team than the Chiefs stuff. Like I, I think that the the Chargers is the best option. They have the best quarterback. They have the better um, team than anybody else that's really being mentioned. Um, I, I don't really see anywhere but LA for him to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and I think I, he really wants to win one to prove that he could win one without Brady. Honestly. I think so too. I, he seems to have a pretty big ego. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I do want to get into some. Uh, I mean, some of this NFL stuff. Uh, I will. I will have to say. I know we've talked about it before, but my God, the Eagles have not failed to amaze me with how horrible they've been. Uh, it, it, I mean, I don't know what I would tell. I, I, I would look like. It, it just feels sort of surreal yeah something is wrong with the eagles obviously they've laid law they they the the three games that we said were going to be easy for them to win the division giants cardinals and giants again they went one and two and they really easily could have gone oh and three um they've won one game where they beat the giants um very closely since big dom got this got uh banned from the sidelines Um, they, I don't know. I, you know, maybe they had that gauntlet schedule. A lot of people talked about that gauntlet schedule they had. Um, maybe that, they won some of those games. Right. But it might've taken so much out of them. Maybe they just, you know what? I think, I think that teams often get worse, but also I think that there's something a bit more technical with it that like, in the sense that like, I think teams also just have better film. I think they have film and know how to beat them more. I think that they, they their offense they just seem very their offense seems very repetitive, and well, I think everybody yeah. knows how to beat it. I mean that like it's crazy because normally when you watch the Giants and the Eagles, like you'll watch it and say the Giants have no chance to win this game. Even at ten nothing, if you were watching that game, you could say that the Eagles have no chance to win this game. Just the way that the game was being played, you could just tell the Eagles even before Jalen Hurts got hurt. And it was yeah. only ten nothing. You were it was just saying the Eagles have no chance to win this game. Like they, yeah. they were just, they're not good at anything right now, especially defensively. And so I, something's wrong. And I, obviously, I think the the defensive like I don't think that a, a team that's competitive has ever really done what they're competitive for a title have ever really done what the Eagles have done, which is to move the defensive coordinator when they move the play calling duties to Matt Patricia. Like that yeah. stuff doesn't happen if you're that normally happens to a four and 12 team. Like it, a lot is going on there. And I, I would be, I think they're going to win, which we'll talk about when we get to the games. I think they're going to win on Monday, but I would not be su- surprised in the slightest if they lost. And yeah, because fades, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they lost, I, I mean, all the games, like the games that felt easy. I mean, so far they're one and two against teams that should be easy for a team with that kind of record. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's just really bizarre 
how it, it's like it's not just disappointing if you're an Eagles, which I don't I don't really feel any particular way about the Eagles, but it, it's also it's not just like angering to a to an Eagles fan. It's bizarre. Like we haven't this is they're basically like the Mets were last year or two years uh, in 2022. That's what the yeah. Eagles are, and I'm not trying to make it about the Mets, but it remind it's so similar to ha- what the Mets were because the Mets were the best team arguably throughout the whole year, throughout most of the year, and then in September they can barely beat teams like the Nationals. Like, and that's what it looks like with the Eagles. They're just like in some sort of slump that is almost like never ending, but it's a slump at the worst possible time, and it's against teams that aren't good. <laughs> like, yeah. I- it, like, yeah, it's, I just it's, feel like you can't trust them. Yeah, I think that the season – and I think the good thing if you're an Eagle fan is now the Eagles fans have kind of, like, admitted the season's over. Um, so I, I think that they are they won't be disappointed. But, yeah, I, I, something's wrong there. I don't know what it is, but something is wrong. Yeah. Um, it, it might be a Sirianni thing. Yeah. Well, he's got – if he's not going to get fired this year, but the way things go in Philadelphia, like – if they were to lose this playoff game and then say they, they got off to a little bit of a slow start um, next season, everyone would be calling for his head immediately. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I could, I could, I could, I could definitely see that happening. I, I think they're missing like Doug Peterson a, a lot. You don't get, you don't get like, well, Doug Peterson was fired like two seasons after he won their first ever Super Bowl. So it's it just goes to show that you don't, two or three seasons. You don't really get like a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, I don't know how to say it, but you you don't really get a lot of uh, good like goodwill and stuff in Philadelphia. Like if it, 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 yeah. Philadelphia is very about what's going on right this second. Yeah, it's. It, I, I think that Philly fans, and this has changed recently, but I used to say that Philly fan, Boston fans are like Philly fans if they, if Philly fans won. Right. <laughs> like they're both similar sort of cities. And similar types of sports fans, and Boston has just been a winning version of Philly. Um, right. I mean, people use. I mean, Philly fans hated Andy Reid. They said Andy Reid's not a winner. Uh, yeah. They it, they really yeah. do call. And Doug Peterson, a phenomenal head coach, I think, or it, like he was able to win with Nick Foles. Like it, it, like Doug Peterson was a very good head coach, and you know now they're sort of. Sirianni's an okay head coach, I guess. Um, and they're eventually going to call, for, like you said, they're, they're going to call for his, his head too. Um, so there is a lot with the NFL playoff picture I want to get into. So we're just going to do, there's six games. Feels weird to see uh, NFL football on a Saturday. So Browns at Texans. Texans are getting two. The over-under is 44 and a half. I got to say, I'm riding with... Joe Flacco on this one. It's only a three point spread, a two point spread, and Flacco has been pretty amazing. And the Texans, you know what? It's one of these things where it's like I choose the experience over the youth. Uh, the Texans are still a, a shaky team. Yeah, uh, the Texans back at their time slot. By the way, the Texans when when the Texans had like those JJ Watt years where they were always the four seed, they would always play at four thirty on Saturday on the Saturday. Yeah, like it was yeah. always. So the Texans back at their time slot. Uh, I'm disagreeing with you on this. I'm going with Houston. Um, I, I I think that Joe Flacco has had a great run, and now I think he's going to be you know, the mm, carriage is going to turn into a pumpkin. Um, with Joe Flacco here, it's in Houston. Um, I would take I, I would take the Texans, and I I know that the the, the uh, Browns have a good defense, but uh, the number that pops out at me also is the forty four and a half. Like I, I I would jump on that as well. It's a pretty low number. You think it's um, I I, mm, I don't know. I I mean, here's the thing: the Texans they have a rookie quarterback, a rookie head coach. They do happen to play in a re- in a pretty weak division. I'm not saying I don't give them credit. Right now, I think the Browns look better. Right now, I think Flacco looks a lot better, and he has the experience, which I think could be a bit underrated. The 44.5, yeah, I, just... I would probably take the over, though I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, I feel like it might go down. 
Yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I would take the Texans and the over as of right now. All right, so Dolphins at Chiefs. And if you're gonna, by the way, if you're gonna, if you're gonna take the Texans, you might as well just if you're gonna take the Texans plus two, you might as well just take the money line. Yeah, because they're probably not gonna win by less than that. Right, and you're gonna get better odds. Um, Correct. So yeah. Um, um, so, what were you gonna say? No, I was gonna get into this game. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. The the uh, fact of the wind chill has now changed this game for me, where I. Was kind of on Miami. I, I'm not big into the Chiefs. The Chiefs have been a very up and down team this year, um, and I, I just I haven't been in love with them. But the, the wind chill is going to be in the negatives, uh, like the negative teens, negative seventeen. I'm talking about uh, the Chiefs have played a lot of home games in the playoffs. They're used to this weather. The Dolphins have not, and you think about Tua played at Alabama and he's from Hawaii. So he's not really used to that cold weather. Jalen Waddle into Alabama. Like it, the, these guys are not, I think that the weather factor or the cold is going to be um, an issue here. And I am going to take uh, the chiefs and the four and a half uh, lay the four and a half. Yeah. You know what? I was thinking the same thing. The doll, uh, because I, here's the thing. I don't, I'm not really in love with either team. Um, the Dolphins, like I said before, are they, they usually flex their big muscles against average, uh, bad to mediocre teams, but usually come up short against, you know, the elite teams, um, except that time against the Cowboys. Um, in game, but the flip side is the Chiefs have regressed, it seems they seem to have regressed significantly. Um, the flip side to what you're saying is that the game will probably be lower scoring given how cold it is, but yeah, either team, but I will say it is going to be a lot harder for the dolphins to deal with like, what is it supposed to be minus 30 degrees? It's not supposed to snow, is it? No, but negative 17, negative but, 17 with the wind chill. Yeah. I mean, I mean that, just, Yeah. That just makes it so much harder on the Dolphins' offense. And, yeah, you, I mean, they're just – most of the time they play in Miami. And they do sometimes play in – like. and I'm looking at their schedule. And they played in New England on in September, so that's probably not that bad. No, uh, I think not. I mean, looking at their – I mean, they played at – they played in Philly in the fall. I mean, I mean like, all of their games – seem to be in relatively mild weather environments for the most part compared to negative 17 degrees. Like it, it, it doesn't it, like, it, there's no way the dolphins could possibly be used to this. Although the flip side is, I think it would hurt the chiefs a little bit too. Um, I, this is really tough. I would lean towards the chiefs though. I would lean towards the chiefs, though. I don't feel very good about it. Yeah, and I, I would also probably go under forty three and a half. I don't think I, I don't think either team is going to be great on offense. I wouldn't touch the total though because both teams' strengths are really their offense. Even though the Chiefs have been better defensively this year, but I I, I just wouldn't touch the total. I don't like the I don't like the Dolphins' defense much at all. Yeah, I would go Chiefs and and I. But the, the Dolphins probably have the best offense in the NFL. Their defense just isn't very good. Yeah, I agree. But uh, I, yeah, I, it's bizarre to me that the Chiefs. That this game is not that uh, the coldest game is not in Buffalo. Yeah, yeah, I know that's rare. Yeah. So uh, Steelers at Bills minus ten uh, over under thirty five and a half. I love the Bills. I, I think the Bills are a hot team right now. The Steelers are barely. <laughs> uh, the Steelers barely snuck in. Uh, the Bills played with. They had the fire in their belly, as they say. Uh, they, they played. They played with an extreme sense of urgency because they there was a very good chance of them not even making the playoffs. Yet they ended up winning the division. Uh, right now, I feel like the Bills are arguably the hottest team in the NFL. I think they could beat anybody. Uh, I think they should win this by two touchdowns or more. Yeah, this reminds me of when the Steelers snuck into the playoffs two years ago. 
um, in that last game, and then they just got absolutely worked over by the Chiefs. Um, yeah. I mean, the Steelers also like they weren't that good of a team. Like they haven't been that good of a team. They are they they got in because. Jacksonville lost to Tennessee and they got in because nobody played their starters. They, uh, the Ravens, nobody played of the starters. Nobody played on the Ravens and they also barely beat the Ravens. Um, they didn't exactly blow them out of the water with nobody playing. Uh, I agree bills. Um, and I would also house uh, Josh Allen to throw an interception because he's thrown an interception every game this season. Um, yeah, and he, I, I, the one thing about that game, the Bills were trying to give the Dolphins that game, and the Dolphins just wouldn't take it. It was unbelievable. Like the, the Bills yeah. made every mistake you could make, and the Dolphins just didn't <laughs> take the game ever. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, yeah, both teams they were just trying to do that to each other, but I, I mean, so yeah, that game was just largely poorly played. I mean, Josh Allen is like a roller coaster. I mean, just watching him play must give you it must be, give Bills fans like heart attacks watching Josh Allen play. I mean, yeah, yeah. every single game, it is just some weird like story. Even games that they win by a lot, it's like Josh Allen messed up in some way through an interception. It, like it, it just feels like he always goes through these games and just throws away points. It seems like yeah, every game he's throwing interceptions. Crazy. Yeah, I, I mean. I mean, he's a risk taker. What can I tell you? I mean, the the best quarterbacks often throw a lot of interceptions. Like the best hitters strike out often. Like it's yeah, no. it's just kind of part of it. Um, Packers at Cowboys, similar type of game. Like I said, I love Dallas minus seven, um, especially if this line goes down to six and a half. Uh, it, very similar type of game. Cowboys are playing at home against the Packers, who barely snuck in. Um, it, it, it this this feels like uh, an easy win for Dallas. Yeah, I agree. Pack uh, Cowboys. I would take. I, I saw this at seven and a half, but I guess it's gone down to seven, which is a big deal. Uh, but um, I, I would still take the Cowboys. I think they're going to roll over the Packers. Um, but the Packers didn't sneak in like the the Steelers snuck in. Like the Packers have been pretty good at at times. Um, and the Packers do have some, like, I, the only thing that would scare me is the Packers have some, like, mojo where they always beat the Cowboys for some reason. Yeah, but, I mean, that was also with Aaron Rodgers. So I, I will take the Cowboys. I think they're going to rock them. But don't don't um, don't um be surprised if if the Packers do pull the upset. But I, I do think that the Cowboys are going to win by more yeah, than And 50-and-a-half, I would, pro- uh, I would probably go under there. That's, no, I you would think take the over. over. Yeah, I would, I would probably take under. I think Dallas could cover the over by themselves almost. <laughs> I mean, Dallas' I offense know. is really good. So, I mean, their defense. So is their defense. Yeah, but I if mean, you think the Cowboys are going to blow out the Packers, then you'd think that like the defense might take their foot off the pedal, right? A little bit, uh, unlike so Jalen Carter. You, so you could get some garbage time touchdowns. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, Rams at Lions, minus three. I mean, it's hard to just rely on garbage time touchdowns. That's the thing. If one team's hardly going to score, it's very hard to go over. I mean, and this is a playoff game. I mean, it's it, it's hard to expect the team to, to score that much by themselves. By the way, the flip side is the offense will take their foot off the pedal too. Mm, defenses do it more than offenses, but yeah. It's but even offenses, I mean, in the fourth quarter, I mean, they, they might pull their starters if it's that much of a blowout. Which would also affect the over under. Um, Rams at Lions. Lions minus three. Uh, I really do like the Lions, although I wouldn't, especially if the line go, the line goes down to three uh, to two and a half. I think the Rams right now could hang with anybody. No hate to the Rams, although the Lions are the home team and overall are uh, a more skilled team than the Rams. And I don't know what the weather is going to be like. In uh, oh, that's right there. They play in a dome, so yeah, they play in a dome. Uh, they play in a dome, uh, so that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Ram, uh, but, but I think um, the the Lions are just, they have a better offense. They're a more skilled team. The only thing is the quarterback play is better for the Rams. But overall, the Rams, I, I mean, look, recently the Rams have been, I think the Rams have improved. Uh, but three points, 
like I said, especially if it goes down to two and a half, I don't think it's really I, – I, I don't think it's that big of a spread, so, so that's a concern. So I would just take the Lions. Uh, I'm going to take the Rams. A couple of reasons. One, I'm in Los Angeles, so it would be disservice not to take the home team. <laughs> Um, but secondly, I just think that this is, I agree that the quarterback play is better. And I think it would be very like, I don't know how to say it, but it, it would be very lions esque to win the division for 30 first time in 30 years. And then you get beat by the guy who you traded away. Yeah. Like that's that true. would be very lions moment. And I also, I think that the, all, like the job that you talk about also, um, we talked about Pete Carroll earlier. The job, he, the sh- job Sean McVay has done with this Rams team this year is is incredible. I yeah. mean, you have no first rounders on this team. Um, what he did, you know, Puka is one of the best offensive players in the league right now. Like what he's done with this team has been great, and I, I can see it continuing. And also, like the, the Lions don't get the advantage of playing the LA team because, or the LA team coming to them because it's at night and it's in a dome. So they don't have the time zone advantage and they don't have the uh, weather advantage. Yeah. Yeah, that's... that's so I'm going to take the Rams. I think the Lions could win the game, but I think that the Rams could co- will cover. And yeah, I, would I mean, look, if the line team. goes up, maybe I would agree with that. Um, uh, but right now, I, I'm still big on the Lions. I think they can score a lot of points. Uh, the Rams, they're a little... Eh. They're, they are a little shaky, I think. Um the Eagles at Bucks. Honestly, I was really big on the Eagles before, and like I said, I don't know how much this line is going to go up or down, but I re- I think I like the Bucks. I mean, the Eagles have just never failed to amaze me with how bad they've been. I, I mean, it, it, they lost to the Cardinals, who are completely out of it. They hardly had anything. They really had nothing to play for. They just got killed by the Giants. Um, I, I mean, the Bucks are probably a better team than both of them. And they're going on the road. I, I just feel like they're not, and especially if this line goes up to three and a half. I really feel like the Eagles aren't really that much better than them. I don't know. I, I think I, I'm going to take the Eagles. Um, I, I mean, also remember, like you were talking about, uh, <clears throat> you were talking about the Texans playing in a bad division. The uh, Buccaneers playing a really, really bad division. Um, the worst division in football, probably. And remember, they only won nine nothing on Sunday against the worst team in football by far. So I, I'm not also sold that the Buccaneers are that good. Um, great turnaround uh, this season by Baker Mayfield. By the way, he's earned himself a starting spot permanently in yeah. in, in Tampa. But uh, I, I think I'm going to take the Eagles. And the Eagles beat him up in the same exact situation Monday night game in, in Tampa earlier this year. And I know obviously the Eagles were a different team earlier in the year. But yeah, that, that's the point I'm, I'm making. St- I'm still going to take them in this game. And I'll honestly, I'll, I'll, I was a bit disappointed when the Bucs won the division. I wanted to see uh, Derek Carr in. And I'll hammer the over as well. Um, I would take the over too. I don't know. For some reason, I just have this soft spot for Derek Carr. I wanted to see him in the playoffs. I guess because two years, two or three years ago, he was like one of the best quarterbacks in football. He he occasionally has had these sparks where he's one of the better quarterbacks in football. Uh, So I kind of wanted to see the Saints in, but I don't know what. I guess that that's what you do when you don't when your own team is out. You just start picking and choosing. (laughs) Uh, So I I want to get into some of this. um, So this Darko Rajakovich rant. Uh, the Raptors head coach went on this huge rant uh, in the post-game press conference criticizing uh, the officials because they weren't getting foul calls. I didn't watch the game, so I don't know. Uh, I, I don't watch random Raptors-Lakers games all that much. Um, I, I may have watched some of the game. I don't remember which day this was. Um, but it was it, – he, he basically eviscerated – the the refs he ended up getting fined i think 20 what was it twenty five thousand dollars i think yeah um which i wish i could get fined twenty five thousand dollars <laughs> that, that that's the first thing i think twenty five thousand dollars that's just a fine for these uh coaches uh so i don't know exactly he basically just eviscerated the refs in this rant yeah so the um uh, the uh, Raptors were playing at the Lakers um, on uh, the other night, and um, it was it was a close game. The Lakers ended up winning, and um, 
the Lakers shot 23 free throws. So they went to the free throw top free throw line 12 times in the fourth quarter, which is a lot. Um, and he was going off about how Scotty Barnes was their best player was basically, he was is, is the gist of the rant was that the star players were getting calls and the Raptors they're basically thinking are not like getting calls so that they have to, um, they have to um, like give, give, not give the Raptors many calls. And he was saying Scotty Barnes is going there and, and uh, he, like saying about Scotty Barnes is an all-star player, but he's going hard to the rim and he's not getting any calls. And he said in, in, in times of rant that the league basically wanted the Lakers to win. And that the, if that was the case, they shouldn't have even shown up to the arena. Um, that was the gist of his, of his um, rant. Right. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't know if you watched the game. It wasn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a game. Uh, so basically he said, I understand respect for all stars and all that, but we have star players on our team as well. How is it possible that Scott, I mean, Scotty Barnes is a star player. Uh, it, how is it possible that Scotty Barnes, who is an all-star caliber player in this league, he goes every single time to the rim with force and trying to get to the rim without flopping and not trying to get foul calls. He gets two free throws for a whole game. How is that possible? How are you going to explain that to me? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it could just be true that his team just fouled more. Um, I also think it's weird that he's saying we should also, it, rather than saying it, you should be treated the same regardless of whether they're star players or not, he's saying we also have star players, so we should also get special treatment. That's what it seems yeah, like. Exactly. He's saying. Yeah, exactly. His his rant is that if you're going to give star, you're giving special treatment, give our one. I mean, he's right that obviously, like like anybody who watches the NBA, which we've talked about before, the NBA has by far the most uh, conspiracy theories about it. That like the league wants this team to win, the league wants something. Yeah, like like, like, that, like the official, uh, like there's a lot, like the integrity of the NBA is compromised when it comes to officials a lot more than any other sport. Right, and that like you clearly the star players do get a lot of calls. Um. In the NBA, and the star players always get more of the calls than uh, the other players. So I think that a lot of people are sympathizing with him on this because it, it is pretty obvious that star players get a lot of calls late in the game. But and if you look at the 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 disparity of free throws, especially especially like because the the, the Raptors do go inside just as much as the Lakers. So to have a big disparity, normally when you have a disparity in free throws it would be a, a bigger team is shooting more free throws than the team that shoots threes or whoever, because they're not going into the lane. But right. yeah, I, I, and obviously when the Lakers and LeBron are involved and shoot 23 free throws in the fourth quarter, that stuff's going to get brought up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that that's definitely true. Like, like if I didn't, like I said, if I didn't watch that game, I, I mean, I didn't watch that game. So I, I, I don't really know. And normally I wouldn't really care. It just, it, it, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, it, it, part of the reason is because I think part of the reason the NBA has this reputation is because it's very star player driven and players, and, and it's a lot easier to like give special treatment to individual players more so than in any other sport. In football, there's so much like, Football is such a complicated game. It's kind of hard to really pin anything down. Baseball, it's just, I mean, base, in baseball, it's like refs, uh, umpires have different, like, some umpires call bigger strike zones than others and things like that. But it's generally, and, and calls are not always going to be perfect, but most of baseball calls are very objective. It's like, if a player is safe or out, that is a very objective call. There's no real like mm. judgment involved. Uh, basketball is obviously a lot different. Uh, and I guess you would say football, it can be kind of similar, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it's certainly not good for the integrity of the game. I mean, refs, I mean, everybody likes to blame the refs and things like that. I don't necessarily think the league has an incentive to now just because refs, often give star players the benefit of the doubt when maybe they shouldn't 
it doesn't mean that it's some sort of top-down conspiracy theory. It could just that the league wanted. I I don't think that's true. I think refs often, you know, they're they're sometimes very good friends with the star players, and they have right. sort of an unconscious bias in favor right. of them. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily some conspiracy theory. Um, I don't know. Anything else you want to add? No. I mean, well, the one thing I would add is that I, I know that a lot of people think LeBron gets a lot of calls, and he does, but he also does go into the in like into the paint a lot. Yeah, he so, does draw a lot of fouls. Like when 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 you play into the paint, you're going to get a lot of contact, no matter what. Right. Um, so there's some sports media wars going on right now. One of them is Jason Whitlock versus Stephen A. Smith. Uh, basically, Jason Whitlock basically started this particular uh, feud, although it seems to have been going on for a long time. But this particular part of it, uh, basically, Jason Whitlock was claiming that Stephen A. Smith uh, fabricated his whole college basketball career. Uh, feels a little weird for him to do that if that were true because he hardly played. Uh, it was at a very small, I think it was Winston, Winston, Sta- uh, Winston Salem Winston State. Winston Salem University. State, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, it would be a weird thing to fabricate. It's not like he's claiming he played at like Duke or anything like that. Uh, it, it would be a weird thing to sort of fabricate. Um, but then Stephen A. Smith went nuts and very personal with it. Uh, I always find sports media feuds to be uh, the most fun to follow. I feel like, though, this definitely goes a lot deeper. I read from Andrew Marchand that Stephen A. Smith had a clause in his contract that he was never to work with Jason Whitlock, which I thought was very funny. Correct. And um, he was um, – he he, uh, – Stephen A. Smith called his pastor. He called uh, <laughs> that was the funniest his, part. Called his bosses before he did this because he never goes off. Um, Jason Whitlock is obviously a jerk. He's if you listen to him talk, he's potentially one of the dumbest people alive. He's and he uh, always is causing controversy. And clearly, like nobody wants to work with him. Um, one of the the points of the rant was that um, he wanted uh, Jason Whitlock wanted like Howard Bryant and Jamel Hill. Um, and people like that to come to undefeated with him when he was going there and nobody wanted to work with him. And like you said, Stephen A. Smith had the clause in his contract. Um, but this was very funny because Stephen A. Smith called him a bitch and called him a fat piece of shit uh, in the rant on the Stephen A. Smith show, which is uh, – if you ever watch like clips from his podcast, is hilarious. Like the, the clips are hysterical. Yeah, but uh, they're accidentally hysterical. Even if unintentionally. <laughs> um, but this was very um, – this was very uh, – uh, targeted and obviously they had a lot of dispute at ESPN because of um, whatever it was, but because of the way that Stephen A. Smith reacted. Um, but anybody, I, Stephen A. Smith, I don't understand. Like you said, like Jason Whitlock was making it seem like Stephen A. Smith was like talks about his career like he's he was Steph Curry or something. Like nobody thought that he was a legendary college basketball player. He would he would he wouldn't he wouldn't say he was a legendary college basketball right. player. Like it wasn't a big deal, but. I don't think that anybody can knock Stephen A. Smith. Obviously maybe he stretches the truth. Sometimes he's very loud and boisterous and stuff like this, but nobody can knock what Stephen A. Smith does because he's by far the most successful sports commentator in the whole country. I mean, he's so, he's so successful as a sports commentator. He filled in for Jimmy Kimmel on late night TV. Right. I mean, he's become a cultural figure largely. I, I mean, that's how successful he is. I, they did I mean, SNL skits about him. Yeah, I mean, and by the way, SNL's audience probably mostly does not watch sports, I would bet. Right. And it was still very, and it still was worked out great with SNL. <laughs> like, uh, that's how culturally significant he's become, uh, largely because of social media and just because right. of his character, who he is. Uh, I don't know. It, it was just bizarre to me because I've never seen him get personal like that. I've never seen that before. No, the only the he only time prefaces I've... everything with saying we're good friends and yeah. The only time I, I hate I can... to say this because this guy so and so is a friend and all of that. The only time, and this is not like this is this isn't like in the same way that he did this one. But the only time I can remember him really saying anything personal was when he said the Lamar Odom thing that the the Knicks that uh, Phil Jackson signed Lamar Odom he was on crack. Like that I mean, was that's like not personal. That's objectively true. He was on crack. That is. <laughs> like, 
but that's the last time I can remember him going personal. But this was this was electric. And if you see, like he 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 put out like before he did this, he put on Twitter like I'm f- gonna finally address that fat bastard. Like to yeah. man, like it, it it was it was obviously like a lot of harboring resentment. Yeah, it, it was. I've never seen anything like that come out from him on such a personal level. No. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was uh, interesting, to say the least. Uh, speaking of Jimmy Kimmel and all of this stuff at ESPN, Pat McAfee versus ESPN versus Aaron Rodgers versus Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> uh, so Pat McAfee said like yesterday or a few days ago that Aaron Rodgers wasn't going to go on the show for the rest of the football season. Didn't mm-hmm. happen. Uh, Aaron Rodgers went back on the show. Uh, and uh, it, I don't know. This whole thing is a little bizarre because it seems like it wasn't necessarily Pat McAfee's decision to have Aaron Rodgers not go back on the show. Uh, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, it reminded me it, – it, it was a similar situation where um, a, a couple of days ago, Selena Gomez put out this whole uh, Instagram post about how she was taking a break from social media and all this stuff about how she's going off social media. And then uh, she posted 19 hours later on, yeah. uh, on Instagram. <laughs> uh, it's very similar. Like he's saying that uh, he's not going to be on the show. And made, it was it was a big – like it was one of the top stories on ESPN if you went on the website – that Rogers wasn't going to be there for the rest of the year. And he said, I mean, I don't know. Rogers also was like, was like putting up a lot of conspiracy theories and stuff in the response to Jimmy Kimmel. Um, He's uh, um, he said something like he basically, they were just like, he, he was saying that he didn't say that Kimmel was on the list. And he was saying that he denounced anybody who basically was calling Jimmy Kimmel a pedophile at all. Um, but then he started going into like a ton of, va- he, he mentioned like Kimmel's jokes about vaccines and then went into like a ton of vaccine stuff. Like it kind of went off the rails. Um, and if you ever watch that show, when Rogers is on, Rogers does 90 to 95% of the talking. Well, and, obviously he's Aaron and, Rogers. And, uh, and, and <laughs> McAfee does five to 10 and AJ Hawk does zero. Like AJ oh, Hawk literally one. just, What? Yeah, point one percent maybe. <laughs> literally, he literally like he, he might like when when he asked uh, Rogers is that the Epstein client list that might be like the only thing AJ Hawk has ever said during a time when Rogers is on. Like he literally just sits there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, also it, it, it's not like like also like the regular season did just end, so it's not like I assume they're not going to have Aaron Rodgers on every Tuesday like during non NFL time anyway because there's not like sure. a lot to talk about. So it wasn't like the the biggest deal if he's not on the rest of the season. Right, right. But he also went at um, the guy, um, whoever he was. Oh, there was a guy who made a tweet like saying that we don't, um, uh, we don't um, condone whatever. He he was saying something about Aaron Rodgers, and Aaron Rodgers was talking bad about him on the show. And the guy is like the VP of marketing and like a high up person in ESPN. So Aaron Rodgers obviously like doesn't like have like a lot of regard for ESPN. So why would he? <laughs> like he well, but they're not but ESPN's not gonna be happy about him going on shows and talking right, about right. people who work there and stuff like that. Yeah. No that's that's Disney as well. That part is definitely true. And and Jimmy Kimmel responded with I mean with a very like unfunny rant um about Aaron uh just a, a lot of really bad jokes about Aaron Rodgers. It's like well he didn't graduate college. It's like, yeah, he didn't graduate college because he went to the pros. I he <laughs> like, he's a I professional Jimmy athlete. Kimmel, of course, he's not going to graduate college. I mean, I actually, I thought Jimmy Kimmel's rant was pretty good. It was, it was being pretty praised online. Um, but I that thought it was pretty it was good. good. I thought it, no, I thought it was a pretty good response. Um, and and um, Aaron Rodgers is um, Aaron Rodgers is uh, uh, obviously like very like. It's it's funny because he is kind of like thin skinned Aaron Rodgers because if somebody he says something, I don't like disagree. Him, definitely remember. I it. think most famous people are thin skinned. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, maybe they should do um. Why don't they do instead of Aaron Rodgers Tuesdays to talk about the NFL? They should do Jordan Rodgers Tuesdays to talk about this upcoming season of The Bachelor. <laughs> they should have Jordan Rodgers and Aaron Rodgers on. 
No, yeah, that would be tough. I don't know but, if Aaron uh, Rodgers would agree with that. He doesn't really get along with his family. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I I I think that obviously he's he's like he's poking the bear at ESPN as well and very pissing off people there. And and McAfee obviously went into the rant about how he thought the show was being like ruined from within by ESPN. I I I, I think that you could see the McAfee show go in a couple of years. Like that it's it's getting like. To a point where but they're probably need ESPN. upset with him. He doesn't need ESPN. That's the thing. Well, I think neither of them need each other. No, although I, I think that ESPN needs him more than the other way around. I mean, Mac. I mean, by the way, when he says that the show is being sabotaged by somebody higher up, that is likely true. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but th- that doesn't sound like something that wouldn't happen at ESPN. I don't know for a fact, but it's also, you know, like not the, like I can see it happening because he's probably pissed off people at ESPN. Like now with, with Rogers coming on and talking about Mike Foss and stuff like that, like you, it's, it's probably pissed people off as well. Like it's, yeah. it's not, gonna, they're not going to be as receptive to it at ESPN. Yeah. But I mean, the thing with Rogers is, and McAfee, by the way, is that the consequences for this aren't really all that bad. They're not just, I mean, they are employees, but, you know, without ESPN, they're fine. And Aaron Rodgers doesn't need to appear on ESPN a lot. And if he's going to like, I I almost in a weird way, don't blame him because if I was in his position, I would be fine with calling out people who call me out on social media, even if it pisses off people at ESPN, because what does he care? And, you know, I think that all professional, most professional athletes, especially quarterbacks, probably have big egos. I don't think Aaron Rodgers is the only one. I don't, I really don't, I rarely blame athletes for having big egos because I would likely have a big ego too in their position. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I'm fine, especially with Rodgers. Like his whole life has been like, like he often, he often talks about how like that, he had a professor at Cal who said, you're not going to, who told him, who laughed when he said he was going to go to the NFL and stuff like that. So I think he always seems to have some sort of chip on his shoulder. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I want to talk about this other story. This guy got stuck in a vase. Yeah, uh, this this guy was like, it was a house party, and um, his friends were or whoever it was were filming. the The video started with him like he must have jumped into the vase or whatever it was. It was like a big like thing, like almost like you would put like big gigantic like plant in, and his half his body was stuck in it. And then they were trying to pull him out and they just couldn't get him out. And then finally at the end of the video, they smashed the vase open. Um, and it cost they, they I read some tweets from people who were there apparently that said that the cost was gonna be about three thousand dollars, which is if you've ever woken up after a night out and been like, Holy shit, I spent so much money. But breaking a three three thousand dollar vase is probably the top of the list on that <laughs> for somebody. The thing is, how do you get stuck? It was in Alabama, by the way, so I'm not really surprised. <laughs> uh, how do you get stuck in a vase? I, I, I'm guessing they took the plant out and then he jumped in. The thing is, whose idea was this? Probably his or one of his buddies. But I mean, probably, I don't know how. You, how do you split the bill for that? Is, does he? Does the guy who got stuck in the vase? Is he the only one who pays it? Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's got to be awkward. Like, obviously, he's the guy that gets billed, right? And then, and then I don't know what. Like, it's awkward after, especially like, I, I, you've you've had a night out where like everyone's had a night out where like videos get sent of them in a friend in a group chat or stuff. Like, imagine like going on a night out and then like you're just super viral the next day. Yeah, it's like yeah, something that... really stupid you did. Yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, it's just a. W- the point I'm making is don't jump into a vase. <laughs> if you're on the really, fence, just remember it, the $3,000. It was a really funny video because it was like everyone was around the vase and like someone was like, they were just trying to like pull him out. It looked like a cartoon almost like they were just trying to pull him out. And then someone else was pulling on the vase and he was like, he, was like, oh, he, he, he said that he tried to take his belt off and his pants off. So like then someone was tweeting that once he got out of the vase, he was just like walking around pantless. Like he had no pants or anything on because he had to, he took everything off to try and get out of the vase. That's the least of his problems, though. It was it was an extremely funny video, and it was it was kind of um, it was kind of matched this weekend with the guy who jumped into the Bass Pro Shops um, 
Yeah, um, yeah, that cool naked. So you know, naked. Goes to, and his yeah, dick so, was so small nobody could see it. They were I think like, that was in Alabama as well. I think it might have been. I think um, it might have been. It, what, so what a, what a week. week for Alabama. What a week, which by the way, I wanted to say um the tweet of the week was that uh people had left um these uh little like pot like cream pies and um and a bunch of stuff like flowers and and some people have Coca-Cola outside of Nick Saban's statue. And someone had the tweet that uh, Coke and cream pies was also how Rick Pitino went out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty amazing tweet. That was, and, that and somebody, was, I saw somebody else say he's not dead. Yeah, that was, that was an insane thing. So it was, it was a, um, it was a, uh, a banner week um, for the, for the state of Alabama. Yeah. Uh, the, the 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 vase the Bass Pro Shops and then Nick Saban retired. Maybe that maybe that led to the retirement. He was just like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. <laughs> All right. So on that note, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be back next week. This was moving the goalposts.